Hello and welcome back to the Winning Agendas Flesh and Blood series. My name's Jesse Marshall and I'm here with a deck tech about a very exciting deck that I've been really enjoying playing uh, in the classic constructed format and that is Sir Bolton Breaker of Dawn. So this is our, our hero. Uh, it's a four intelligence like all heroes currently in the game which means you have four cards in hand um, or you draw up to four at the end of the turn. Uh, it's got 40 life uh, and it says if you've charged this turn Attacks you control have plus one strength while defended by an attack action card. So if your opponent blocks your attacks on a turn that you've charged, which we'll come to in a moment, um, your attack actions that turn, oh sorry, all your attacks that turn, uh, have plus one strength if your opponent blocks with an attack action card. Um, which means, I mean, in most decks you'll see that a decent proportion of the cards, usually over half, are going to be attack action cards. Um, so if your opponent's blocking you on turns that you charge, then you basically make their blocks minus one value or make your attacks plus one strength, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, as an attack reaction, you can also banish a card from Sir Bolton's soul uh, to give an attack with power greater than its base power, go again. Um, that pairs really nicely with Raiden Duskbane, which is the weapon that we've chosen to use in this deck. Um, so it's a zero cost attack once per turn pay zero to attack uh, but it's only got zero strength the bonus though is that if you've charged this turn uh, raiding gains plus three strength so that synergizes with bolton in a couple of ways one is that bolton already wants you to be charging um, in order to turn on his ability that penalizes them for blocking um, so you get that automatic synergy there raiding gets buffed when you've charged which is something bolton wants you to do anyway um, raiden also gets plus three strength which means that its base, sorry, its attack power is greater than its base power, which means you can use Bolton's attack reaction to give it go again. So not only do they synergize really well, but Raiden's attack also costs zero resources, which means we can be a little bit more aggressive with our resource curve. Um, so you'll see in this entire 80 cards, we've only got six blues, which is the three impenetrable beliefs over here in the sideboard um, and three take flights which is just a card that we want to play nine of because it's so important to Bolton strategy. Um, we'll have a quick look at the rest of the equipment uh, quickly. Uh, this is There's only the, the four pieces of equipment, one for each slot, plus one Null Rune Hood in the sideboard. Um, I don't often bring in the Null Rune Hood. In fact, I may end up cutting it. I don't love playing it against Bolton, uh, sorry, against Chain. Um, in, in some ways, it's better to have Arcanite Skullcap anyway, but I, I've just been sort of testing it out and, and there are some times when it does come in handy. Um, the, the four equipment we're playing are Valiant Dynamo. Uh, a lot of people are playing Refraction Bolters over Valiant Dynamo, but I love Valiant Dynamo. It often blocks for at least three or four. Lumino Ascension basically reads, remove a counter from Valiant Dynamo, uh, which means that every time you play Lumino Ascension, you're getting an additional block out of your Valiant Dynamo. So you can be a little bit aggressive with blocking with this, which is nice. Um, and any piece of armor that has like block two or greater, is a good piece of armor. Um, on that note, we've got Brave Forge Braces, mostly just because it blocks for two um, and it's got Battle Worn, but occasionally you do get to use the activated ability, though being, as I said, relatively resource light, we don't often want to dedicate resources to that. Um, Arcanite Skullcap is just, you know, a generic uh, block for two Battle Worn, as long as you're behind on life. We don't often get behind on life, so often this is actually just a block one, but, you know, once you do get later into the game, and your opponent's grinding you down on key turns, just having that extra one block can be the difference between winning and losing. Um, and then we've got Find or Spring Tunic, which of all of the equipment, I think Spring Tunic is the most important one for actually the functionality of the deck, because very often we don't want to be pitching a card for resources on key turns. Um, and Tunic allows us not to have to pitch any cards because we can sort of go off on a big turn with a Take Flight or via the Vanguard uh, with just one resource from the Tunic. So no, no requirement to pitch cards. So Tunic, very important. I think probably the most important of the equipment if you're looking to build this deck on a budget. Um, Tunic's also you know really useful for a range of, of different decks. So um, worth picking one up if you can. If you can't, um, Heart and Cross Strap is a fine replacement. But yeah, if you can get a Tunic, that'd be the first piece of equipment I'd look for legendary equipment um, in terms of this deck. I think the next sort of best to pick up is probably the Skull Cap, just because it is generic and you can use it in pretty much every classic constructed deck at the moment, um, perhaps with the exception of Leviah, who wants to play um, the Shadow 
headpiece. Um, Valiant Dynamo and Braveforge Braces are kind of nice to have, but yeah, absolutely you could play Refraction Bolters if you wanted to, um, and you could play um, either of the common equipment for the arms from um, uh, Monarch, uh, either Stubby Hammerers or Bolton's Gallantry Gold. Gallantry Gold probably um, slightly better, um, but actually uh, either of them is really just going to give you sort of plus one on a key turn, so you could go with either of those. Um, occasionally plus two. So getting away from the equipment onto the, the cards, the, the really important thing, as I mentioned earlier, between both Raiden and Sir Bolton, they're both wanting us to be charging every turn. So we need to maximize the number of charge cards we have in the deck. There are only a limited number of cards, all from Monarch, that actually say charge, um, that have that keyword on them. Um, the two most important ones, and the two most powerful ones, which we're playing nine of and six of, are Take Flight and Bolts of Courage. Take Flight is really important it costs one resource to play, uh, which can be a little bit annoying, but Tunic can really help there, as I mentioned. Uh, but the important thing about Take Flight is that it allows you to charge, but then it doesn't take up the card that it charged to give it go again, because it naturally gains go again if you've charged this turn. So that allows for some play patterns where you're having a reasonably big turn, particularly with a red or a yellow Take Flight. Let's say you've got a red one, um, it's got four attack. Um, so you spend one resource, come in with your four attack Take Flight, charge a card, you don't need to banish the card that you've charged to give it go again, because it just gains go again from you having charged this turn. Then you can come in with Raiden for zero, and you've had sort of a seven damage turn for one resource and one card charged, but your one card charged actually remains in your soul for use on a future turn. So that's a really, really efficient turn. Those are kind of the ones you want to build for. V of the Vanguard allows you to do a similar thing um, in that you can charge a couple of cards um, to give plus one for each light card charged this way. Um, you can banish one of them to give the V of the Vanguard go again because it then has uh, power greater than its base power. You can then attack with Raiden, which also gets the bonus from the V of the Vanguard. So if you charge two cards, you come with five with V of the Vanguard, five with Raiden for 10 damage. Um, it has cost you one resource plus the V plus two cards that you've charged but you still end up with one card charged in your soul. So that can be a pretty good turn as well. Um, so Take Flight and V the Vanguard both allow you to kind of profit on cards in your soul, or rather in the car, in the turn with more cards in your soul than you began with, whilst still having a reasonably big turn. Um, Bolt of Courage allows you to get away with some bigger turns off smaller hands because it has the, if it hits, draw a card trigger. Um, it's also something that incentivizes blocking because you drawing a card can be quite a big deal um, and your opponent might want to prevent that. And that increases the likelihood that Bolt of Courage is going to gain power greater than its base power from Bolton's buff ability to allow you to give it go again. So the challenge with all of the other charge cards other than Take Flight and V of the Vanguard is that Bolt of Courage, Cross the Line, Express Lightning and Engulfing Light don't naturally give you a way to give them go again or to give them power greater than their base power. So you need to have some cards in your deck, which we've got here in the five Courageous Steel Hands and the three Beacon of Victories that allow us to improve the power of these attacks, either by buffing them with the Courageous Steel Hand or the Beacon of Victory, to then be able to banish a card from our soul to give them go again. So these cards, um, the attack reactions, are particularly important for turns where we're going to be leading off with a Bolt of Courage across the line, an Express Lightning or an Engulfing Light, because we don't want those to be our only attacks for the turn. We want to be able to give them go again so that we can come in with the Raiden, uh, because the strength of Raiden is the fact that it costs zero resources and it basically just tacks on an extra three damage to any of these attacks. And if we don't get to do that on any turn, we're kind of missing out a little bit. Plunder Run is the other way that we can improve the base power of Bolt of Courage, Cross the Line, Express Lightning or Engulfing Light. If it's played from Arsenal, it gives the next attack plus three strength, um, which again means that it's gonna have power greater than its base power um, and we can give it go again with Bolton's ability. So those are kind of the core pieces of the deck. We've got, I think, 28 um, card attack actions that allow us to charge, which is almost half the deck if you're playing 60 cards, which means that you should be seeing one of those in every hand. 
There are, of course, going to be some outlier hands where you don't see any. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to kind of block out and not lose too much tempo on those turns. Uh, and chances are, with all of these other attack actions we've got in the deck here, which we'll come to in a moment, there'll at least be something else that you can do with those hands to put some pressure on. Um, these six cards here are our weapon buffers, if you like. Um, so Luminar Ascension, I mentioned earlier, is a great way to allow us to attack twice with Raiden in a turn. So what it says is, uh, it's the Bolton Specialization, along with Fear the Vanguard, and it says, until end of turn, weapons you control gain plus one strength, and if this hits, reveal the top card of your deck. If it's a light card, put it into your hero's soul and gain one life, otherwise put it on the bottom of your deck. So that part of the card allows you to make your Raiden stronger, firstly, secondly, get more cards into your soul, and thirdly, gain some incidental life. So pretty powerful already. The second part of the card says, if you've charged this turn, you may attack an additional time with each weapon you control. Go again. So this is a non-attack action that buffs your Raiden, so makes it attack for four. If you've charged this turn already, so let's say you played a take flight, charged a card, you've come in for four, um, then you play Luminar Ascension, your Raiden is now coming in for four, and it can attack an additional time. Um, and you can give it go again with uh, Bolton's hero ability by banishing a card from your soul. Uh, so that's that can set up some really, really good turns as well as gaining you a little bit of incidental life. It also, as I mentioned earlier, allows you to remove counters from Valiant Dynamo, which says at the beginning of your end phase, if you've attacked two or more times with weapons this turn, you may remove a minus one counter from Valiant Dynamo. So very, very strong synergies of the Luminar Ascension. Then we've got Dusk Path Pilgrimage, which is a little bit more conditional, plus it costs a resource to play. Um, so it's not quite as strong as Luminar Ascension, but it says your next weapon attack this turn gains plus three strength, and if this hits, you may attack an additional time with this weapon this turn. So again, it lets us trigger the Valiant Dynamo by attacking twice with the Raiden, but it's conditional, it requires you to hit with your first weapon attack. Now obviously we can use our uh, attack reactions to help make sure the first Raiden attack hits that turn, but also the fact that the Raiden hit is coming in for six if you've charged this turn, and then if they block with attack actions it's becoming seven, means that there's a decent chance that it'll either hit or it'll take quite a few cards out of their hand for them to defend that turn. So Dust Path can be quite powerful. So that's sort of the core of the charging and the Raiden section of the deck. We've then got um, these attack actions here, which are really just ways to make your big turns even bigger. Like these are kind of the, the cherry on top, if you like, on, on those big turns. So we've got Bolting Blade at the top of the stack here, which says uh, it's a four cost, seven strength attack. Um, and it says Bolting Blade costs two less to play for each time you've charged this turn. Bolting Blade um, is, I often just charge this, you know, it's not something that you often play, but it's really nice to have in the deck for the turns when it's good, because when it's good, it's really good. Um, when you draw this alongside either V of the Vanguard, which can make it free if you've charged two other turns uh, cards this turn. So you imagine a turn where you have a uh, Chinook resource up, V of the Vanguard, Bolting Blade, and two other cards in hand. Um, now, any of those could be an arsenal, so you could have a three card hand plus arsenal, or it could be a four card hand. You go Chinook resource, play V of the Vanguard, charge two cards, V of the Vanguard's coming in for five, uh, then you give the V of the Vanguard go again by banishing one of those cards from your soul. You attack with Raiden for five. You banish the other card from your soul, give the Raiden go again, and you play Bolting Blade for free, come in for seven. You come in for 17 that turn, and it's cost you one resource. Like, that's a very, very strong turn. There are obviously other ways you can do this. Even paying two for it is fine. Like, two for seven is a perfectly fine rate. Um, you could do that, for example, if you pitch a, a blue take flight, to play a red take flight or across the line, um, charge a card, come in, either you have go again from this or you give the cross the line go again. Uh, you come in with the Raiden, give that go again by charging, banishing another card from your soul. Uh, and then you come in with the bolting blade for the other two resources off your blue that you pitched. So that does come around sometimes. Um, as I said, you know, given that we've only got the three blues plus the three impenetrable beliefs in the sideboard, that version of it doesn't come around all that much. Um, but also sometimes if you've got a two card hand, which is just Bolting Blade and another yellow, playing a two for seven attack as your turn off a two card hand is also perfectly defensible. So that's another reason that I like having Bolting Blade in there is that it gives you some uh, more powerful turns when you have to be blocking um, in some games. 
Sorry, I'm getting a little bit uh, out of kilter here with uh, taking cards in and out of this deck. Um, so Valiant Thrust is the next one that can really turn your um, big turns into explosive turns. So it's a one cost attack action. It says, if you've charged this turn, Valiant Thrust gains plus three strength. Uh, I should say all of the cards that I've mentioned so far, other than Plunder Run and Courageous Steel Hand, block for three, I think. Um, so that's one of the other really big strengths of this deck is that you don't have many block twos. So yeah, it's just really the Plunder Run and the Courageous Steel Hand that you have block twos, which means that you've got pretty efficient blocks plus pretty high armor defense values. Um, which is quite important when you're really wanting to be duking it out with your opponent, taking a few attacks along the way and trying to give them back more damage than what they're able to give you. So Valiant Thrust is a one cost attack. It gets plus three if you've charged and it's got four base strength at red and three base strength at, at yellow. Uh, two important things about this card. One is that it naturally gives itself a buff um, if you've charged this turn, which means that it can be given go again with Bolton's hero ability by banishing card from your soul, um, but also just it's a really efficient rate. We've got so many charge cards in the deck, we want to be charging every turn. This gives us a really good and efficient payoff for doing that. It's basically giving you, you know, an extra little raid and attack in there built into the one card, which is really nice. So Valiant Thrust is a good one. You don't always get to use your Valiant Thrusts. That's one thing that I would really caution with this deck is don't get too wedded to them or feel that if you have to charge them out of your hand, then you're losing out in some way. It's actually fine. Like as long as you're doing your basic things, that's the most important thing. You know, charging every turn, coming in with Raiden, charging every turn, coming in with Raiden. That's what you want to be doing as your baseline. If you get to Valiant Thrust or you get to Bolting Blade, that's gravy on top. That's like you're really getting ahead and you're really um, driving it home um, and putting the putting the pain on in a really big way. Uh, but if you have to charge these cards away just to make your basic turns work, don't be afraid to do that. Um, Enlightened Strike is the next one. Again, it's an attack that can naturally buff itself. If you choose the second option, Enlightened Strike gains plus two strength, um, then it's coming, it's a zero for seven. Uh, but it's got plus two, which means that you can give it go again with Bolton's ability. Enlightened Strike is kind of a little bit more iffy. Um, it's good to put it into Arsenal. Um, it's good if you're able to have, you know, a four or five card hand where you can go uh, take flight, Chinook, Chinook resource, take flight, uh, ban uh, charge one card, Enlightened Strike, put another card on the bottom, um, give the Enlightened Strike go again, and then come in with Raiden. You know, that can be a good turn but that does require sort of a few things to go your way, uh, the right cards to be in your hand um, and you to be able to have larger hands. It's also though totally fine, just like Bolting Blade, to have a pretty powerful card like Enlightened Strike where if you do have a two card hand, you can just come in for seven. Um, so yeah, that that is pretty nice. I should have said on the Bolting Blade, obviously, uh, you can't actually do that with a two card hand. It has to be a three card hand. So yeah, it costs four. Forgive me, um, that that was a mistake. But yes, Enlightened Strike, obviously you can uh, go in for a two card hand with seven, which is nice. Um, Bolting Blade from a three card hand though, being able to come in with seven can be okay. Um, or being able to come in for a uh, an attack, charge, um, give it go again, and then Bolting Blade pitching another yellow off a four card hand can also be nice, but again, then we're getting more back up into four card hand territory. Um, Celestial Cataclysm is kind of a little bit iffy in this deck, like it's it's not amazing. Um, you are wanting to be using your charged cards regularly, which means that you don't often end up, aside from if you have a couple of big Luminar Ascension turns in a row, you don't often end up with heaps of cards in your soul. Um, particularly because Beacon of Victory, on the turn you play Beacon of Victory, it really takes up two to three cards from your soul. Like you're actually going quite significantly net down from where you were at the start of the turn, which means that the turns where you end up with heaps of cards, or so the games where you end up with heaps of cards in your soul to play Celestial Cataclysm are sort of few and far between. That being said, having one or two of these in the main deck can be really nice because if you get into a play pattern where you have to be blocking more and just coming in with say, Bolt of Courage Charge, um, or cross the line charge for your turn. At least you know that down the track sometime later in the game, you have the capacity to turn those cards you're charging into a pretty significant advantage and into a really big turn where you go 
charge, you know, take flight, charge a card, Celestial Cataclysm and Raiden. Like that's actually a really big turn and can turn the momentum in the match. So Celestial Cataclysm, I, as I said, I would keep one or two in the main deck. I wouldn't necessarily play three in all matchups. Um, but particularly if you expect that you might get behind on tempo and need to take the tempo advantage back, um, Celestial Cataclysm can allow you to do that. Um, that brings us, I guess, to the end of what's kind of, in general, the main cards that I would play. Um, I would probably start with all of these cards bar the Enlightened Strike and the Celestial Cataclysms in most matchups. Uh, potentially the Plunder Runs might come out in some as well. Um, but I, I would play at least one or two Celestial Cataclysms. I would play the Enlightened Strike probably in most matchups. Um, and Plunder Run, I would only really take out against perhaps Chain, where you don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to set up a couple of turns in advance. Like you really need to just keep on the pressure in the early game. Um, and the setup time for Plunder Run can, can put you behind a little bit on where you want to be. Um, in terms of the cards that are sort of here as the sideboard of sorts, um, Impenetrable Belief is really there just for Chain. Um, it's a blue pitch block three, um, which can be really, uh, block four rather, which can be really nice. Um, I could see that you could play Fate Foreseen over that, even though it's a red, you know, um, resources aren't the biggest deal in this deck. Um, and the fact that you can't Arsenal Impenetrable Belief and then block for four, but you can Arsenal Fate Foreseen and block for four may mean that you prefer um, to play Fate Foreseen over Impenetrable Belief. However, having the extra three blues and still having the capacity to have that block four for zero cost um, means that you can set up things like a Bolting Blade um, or some bigger turns involving via the Vanguard and Dustpath Pilgrimage and something else, um, you know, perhaps even a Braveforge Braces activation. It just gives you that little bit of extra luxury, but again, you miss out on the capacity to arsenal it. So that's a, that's a bit of a flex slot there on the sideboard. Um, you could absolutely go for Fate for Scene Red if you wanted instead. Um, Command and Conquer is really good against Prism. It's really good against Katsu. It's really good against decks that are going to be playing a lot of defense reactions. Um, even Dorinthia. Uh, decks that are going to be playing a lot of defense reactions or decks that are going to be looking to Arsenal frequently. Uh, absolutely, you know, you can't deny the power of Command and Conquer. And again, on a two card hand, pitch a yellow, play Command and Conquer, perfectly serviceable hand. If you can mix it in with a, a slightly bigger turn where you go Tunic Resource, Take Flight, Charge, um, Attack with Raiden, and then come in with Command and Conquer at the end, it can be absolutely devastating. Um, so don't underestimate the power of this card in the deck. Uh, don't be too put off by the two resource cost because you do have heaps of yellows. So it is it can just be you know one card pitch most of the time. Um, and you don't often need to pitch for something else on your turn. So the two resource cost is actually not such a big deal. Chains of Eminence is really just in there for chain. Um, it has really nice synergy with Beacon of Victory. Uh, you can also play this, I should say, against um, Bravo sometimes because they do telegraph their plays a little bit more. Uh, you can also play it against Katsu. Um, it, it does quite a few different things. You know, it says, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a zero cost aura, so it, it's a permanent that stays in the battlefield, but it goes away at the beginning of your next action phase. But whilst it's in play, it says, when Chains of Eminence names the arena, name a card. The named card can't be pitched, played, or used to defend while Chains of Eminence is in the arena. So even naming Flick Flack or something else against Katsu or another ninja uh, can be really nice on a key turn if you feel like you want to try and pump a little bit of damage through and, and have a big turn. But really, the important synergy is being able to play it when an opponent has five or six Soul Shackles, a chain opponent, and name Seeds of Agony or Riftbind. Um, usually Seeds of Agony, um, because Seeds of Agony allows them to do other things, pumps other things, and is free for them to get out of the Banish Zone. Whereas Riftbind, if they don't get out of the Banish Zone, just like Seeds of Agony, they take Blood Debt damage. But if they do play it on a turn when they can't play the Seeds of Agony, A, it's weaker, um, and B, it costs them resources and takes up their attack slots whilst being weaker. So you'd prefer most of the time to name Seeds of Agony unless they've already played heaps of Seeds, but all their Rift Binds are still left in their deck, for example. Um, the nice thing about Chains of Eminence in this particular deck is that you can fetch it with Beacon of Victory, which means 
I, I'm probably going to swap this Remembrance out. I haven't actually got a third Chains of Eminence at the moment, but this Remembrance is going to become a third Chains. Um, so if you've got three of those in your deck and three Beacons, the likelihood in the mid game, assuming that you can pitch your Beacons and your Chains early to keep them in your deck, the likelihood in the mid game that you can chain your Chains together is quite high of being able to go Chains of Eminence one turn, the following turn, Beacon of Victory, four Chains of Eminence, play the Chains of Eminence again, and just keep those Seeds of Agony in their Banish Zone. That can actually be quite devastating, and, and I've won a couple of games, again, really tight games, against Chain Decks with, with that line of play. Uh, Steel Blade Shunt and Sink Below are the two defense reactions in the sideboard. Sink Below probably actually comes in most of the time. Um, it's just a, you know, zero, it blocks for four, zero cost block for four, it's exactly what you want. It just improves your stats slightly across the course of the game and means that you're defending that couple of extra points of damage um, that can really make the difference. Obviously, there are some decks where you just want to be for all out aggression and having Zig Blows in your deck in those games is not ideal. It's still not terrible. Like, even if you lose a little bit of steam and you can't quite hit them as hard as you otherwise would, um, but you can sink below. In, it puts in below on your arsenal and then block one of their attacks on the next turn like that can be fine so um sink below comes in most of the time steel blade shunt comes in against uh Dorinthia, bravo anyone who's going to be giving you heaps and heaps of damage particularly with dominate um just having that in there to protect yourself can be massive uh it, it can also be good against levi or bruce so um yeah, all of those go tall decks having those steel blade shunts in there can make a real difference and again you can play that off your tunic resource um, so that's pretty much covered the deck. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this deck tech. Please feel free to let me know what you think in the comments. Um, it, I really love playing the deck. It's, it's really fun to, uh, be the aggressor in this game, uh, to have heaps of different options. You need to go deep into the tank a lot to think about your lines of play. Cause you, a lot of the time it's quite counterintuitive, particularly with the charging and giving yourself, um, the buffs to actually work out the line of play that allows you to best execute what you want to do with the limited cards in hand. It always feels like you're kind of one card short of what you want to do, which is really, I think, a, a common experience in a lot of flesh and blood decks, which is one of the great things about the game. It's kind of, it's always challenging us to um, play efficiently and think really carefully about what we do to maximize uh, the output. So hope you enjoyed. Um, the only other thing I'm trying to think about other things people have asked me to put in the video, the only other budget thing that I'd mention, uh, I mentioned all the legendaries uh, and what you could substitute those for. There's not really anything too expensive in the deck itself other than the Command and Conquers um, and perhaps the Enlightened Strikes. Enlightened Strikes are completely luxury optional. You could trade those out for uh, more Valiant Thrusts or um, uh, more Yellow Plunder Runs or something like that, uh, or even... Yeah, so Blue Valley Thruster Yellow Plunder Run is probably where I'd go if you couldn't get Enlightened Strikes. And if you don't have Command and Conquers, really don't worry too much about that. You could put in another six attack action uh, to sideboard in against Prism. Um, you could put in Exude Confidence if you have those, if you want something else uh, against Katsu decks or Defense Reaction um, sort of turtle decks. But yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If, if you can't get those... Um, yeah, another six of cost action, another six strength attack action in the sideboard, um, or another way to, you know, yellow plunder runs or something else to buff uh, your attacks is probably best. So, hope you enjoyed. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, yeah, let me know if you enjoyed the deck tech. We'll hopefully be back with some more gameplay footage and some more deck techs on the channel uh, before too long. Cheers.